your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then in the book of Mark, chapter 1 and verse 35, one verse, 35 of Mark, chapter 1. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. He departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Learn of me, Jesus said. So let's watch him. Let's watch him as he grows. We talked a little about that. Today, let's watch him as he prays. Let's ask the Lord to minister to us all together. In Jesus' name, Lord, let these words be seeds that will spring forth fruit and reality. Hallelujah. Help us to turn our eyes up on you, Lord. Thank God, thank God. To fix our gaze upon one who is perfect and never fails. Who is the great teacher. Who is the great instructor. Teach us today. We sit at your feet, Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. How exciting it is to learn when Jesus is the subject. Learning is not only hearing, you see. It's not only assimilation of facts. But it is observing. It's, it's watching the manner. It's observing the attitude. And I want us to see him here as he departs into a solitary place. And there he prayed. If you don't learn anything else at Texas Bible College... If you can't quote every verse in the first five chapters of Hebrews, if you don't know what the meaning is of every beast in Revelation or Daniel or the wheel of Ezekiel's vision, I want you to learn how to pray. I want you to learn how to pray and how to seek God. Jesus never taught his disciples how to preach, but he did teach them how to pray. He taught them not only with his words, but he taught them with his manner, his attitude, and his example. Jesus prayed because the humanity of him was subjecting itself to divinity. For the prophet had said, O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. So Jesus fulfilled the scripture. I want you to notice this about the praying of Jesus. Most of his praying was in private. He often drew away from the crowds. For even Jesus himself in his humanity felt the need for inward refreshing and inward renewal. As Brother Keating so ably put it yesterday. We must have that time of refreshing. We must have that time of hungering after fellowship with the Lord. Now in prayer. He did not condemn public praying. But he did strongly warn against the leaven of the Pharisees who were hypocrites in their praying. They liked to stand in long robes on the street corners and there make their prayer where everybody could hear them. And everybody would know they were praying. They still do it in Jerusalem today. They go to the wailing wall or stand on the streets and there they bend at the waist and hundreds of times read. From a prayer, while they're reading from a prayer book, we back and forth like this. And on they pray and on and on and on, reading from the prayer book and standing at the wailing wall and, and nodding in that fashion. And on they pray. And the next day or next week, they come again and go through the same rituals as they pray. Jesus said it another way and he illustrated it and exemplified it another way he rebuked that activity as being worthless he said enter into your closet move away from what would distract you and come apart 
and get alone and there bring your petition and there make your prayer. You can listen better when you are alone. When you're not on a street corner somewhere where you're not out in public. We all pray in public. Sure we do. But if all of the needs were depending on the public prayers, we wouldn't have very many met. You know that and I know that. Not denouncing public praying. You can come aside and come apart to a degree in a crowd. You can bring yourself apart from them. Yes, you can do that, all right. But there is a time, Jesus said, when you ought to come apart alone into your closet, he said. And there, pray. Take your Bible with you when you go to the closet to pray. Spend some time. You may want to read a little You may want to write a little, so take your pencil and take some writing pad. But take a fertile mind into that prayer closet so that you can hear from God. So that your prayer will be more than just words that come out of your mouth. But you can hear from God during that season of aloneness with him. He departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Pray when you're in the car. You say, well, I don't have time. I don't even have a closet. My, my closet is full of shoes and clothes and all, and, so, and my, my room is not very private or this or that reason or some other thing. But you can still, when you're driving down the road in your car, pray. Pray without ceasing, Paul said. The, the, prayerlessness is the father of every sin. If you're going to live for God, you have to pray. But I don't like to think about it like that. I don't like to think about that you have to pray. But that you get to pray. That you have the privilege of prayer. You can talk to God sitting at your desk. You can talk to God eating in the cafeteria. You can talk to God in the prayer room down there. In your own room. You can talk to God on your job. You can pray without ceasing. You can carry an attitude of prayer. And those who do are those who are victorious. So his praying was in private. His praying was also unselfish. Others were the concern of Jesus in his praying. His prayer in John 17 is rife with words like this. These, those, them, they. The real Lord's prayer is in John 17. And you'll find him praying for others, not just praying for himself. I think God tires quickly of of coming to him with commands. And with personal requests for things that we often want to merely heap upon ourselves to fulfill our own lusts. He said, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss to consume it upon your own lusts. I think God would tire of, Lord, I I need a new car. Lord, I need a new suit. Lord, I need some new shoes. Lord, I need a, a new boyfriend. Lord, I need a new girlfriend. Lord, I need a, something else. You know, I need this. I need that. I need the other. Hey, the Bible said he knows your needs before you ever bow to him. That's not to say you never make a request to God, but he knows your need. If you'll fulfill another need in prayer, that is these, those, them, and they. I believe your own needs will get met a lot quicker than just constantly harping on what you want from God. Pray about somebody else. You know the best way and quickest and easiest way to get a blessing for yourself is in a service. See somebody else and focus on them just a, just a little bit and say, God bless them. Bless them, Lord God. Just renew him and bless him, Lord. Give him a blessing right now. And all of a sudden, you'll find your your own feet getting a little light. You'll find the lead leaving your hands. And you'll find your soul feeling good and refreshed and renewed. In your praying, be unselfish. Learn of Jesus. I believe God answers all of our prayers. But the biggest part of them he has to answer with no foolish child. I think 
that the Lord appreciates those who come to him sometimes without complaint. Someone wrote a song like that, Lord, I, I didn't come to ask anything from you. I didn't come to seek anything for myself. I just came to praise you for all the times of the, in the past that you've blessed me and helped me. I find that to be effective. Before I bring petitions to God, Lord, I want to thank you for every time you've helped me, blessed me. I want to thank you for every time you provided for me. I want to thank you for every time you touched my body and touched my mind and, and strengthened me. And when you think about those times and you let those things go through your mind, it increases your faith for things that you may be petitioning God about at this present moment. But a lot of our praying is complaining about our plight or we're frightened about something or we're doing little more than worrying on our knees about situations. We pray a lot about things that God can't answer. I know people that pray about the weather. I'm not saying uh, that God can't change weather. But make your prayer time count. So you, God can't answer everybody's prayer about the weather. Because somebody's praying for rain. And you're praying for the sun to shine. Somebody else is praying for just to be overcast so they can do something that they're wanting to do in a certain way, you see. So God can't answer everybody's prayer about that. A lot of prayer goes on about relationships. God, give her to me. God, make him like me. You see, it, you know it's true. I, 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 I want him. I want her, and I want her. I, you know, I. So, Lord, work that out. Spend your time praying for things that God can answer you and 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 give you. You see, he he may know that you. That's the last person you need. But you weep and cry and beat your head against the wall because it's not working out and you press and press and press. And I pr people will say, I prayed about it. I'm, I'm going to go ahead, you know, I prayed about it. Well, a lot of people pray about it, but they don't receive any positive answer, but they plow on anyway, you know. Hey, if God wants you to have things and God wants you to have persons, uh, you just... You make yourself subject to God and to his will, his purposes in your life. And, and I believe these other things will be added unto you as you need them. So don't spend your time praying with selfish things like that. God, fix life for me. Make it comfortable for me. Uh, you know, and fix this where I like her, she likes you know, I, him. I Fix that, Lord, because that's what I want. I don't believe the Lord spent a lot of time uh, praying for selfish things. He was praying for others. His own needs were met because he considered others first. His prayer was unselfish. You'll find the prayer of the early church was unselfish. In Acts 4, when Peter was in prison, God delivered Peter. And I believe if, if we prayed specific prayers that like the early church did that perhaps God would would give us a little more attention sometimes God deliver Peter they weren't just praying for something for themselves but they were praying for a man who was taken and thrown in prison an innocent man who was going to lose his life for the gospel they lifted up their voices and God heard them and brought him out of the jail and brought him to the place where they were praying. Our praying needs to be like Jesus' prayer, unselfish. And his prayer wasn't all words. 
In Hebrews 5 and 7, the Bible speaks of Jesus' prayer as being with strong crying and tears. There were times when he ran out of words. There were times when words wouldn't fit. There were times when words wouldn't express what was in his heart, in his mind, in the depths of his soul. There were times when, when verbalization wasn't it. So he wept, he sobbed, he cried. Tears streamed down his face. There are times when the burden of your heart will not be articulated in words and the mind is out of sync with your tongue and human language cannot satisfy the need. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not for what to pray as we should or as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. There is a release in prayer at times. When you get beyond words, when you get beyond speech, and your mind is released from having to think of words, and the prayer comes from deep within you, it does not alight from your tongue, but it comes out of your soul. There is groanings or crying. There are utterances which make no sense. The Spirit is interceding. The Spirit is helping you pray. You're praying for things you don't even know about. You're praying for missionaries you've never seen. You're praying for needs you're not aware of. And that's when prayer really can count the most. When you pray beyond words and you pray beyond the point where it's all flesh and you're praying now in the spirit, the spirit knows needs. He knows places and times and people everywhere. And he understands those needs. And he can use you in intercessory prayer. I thank God for the release in prayer sometimes. Don't you like to get beyond the place where you're trying to think of words to say to God. And if something is flowing from you, you're not trying to show off you're by yourself. Maybe you're, you're not trying to make somebody think you're spiritual, but it's flowing out of you. And words that you don't even recognize are coming forth from your mouth and your lips. But down inside, you know you are communicating with God. He is communicating with you and with somebody else. And some other situation is being affected by your prayer. Oh, what a sweet release that is. Because you can't think of everything you need to pray about. You don't know what's coming tomorrow. You don't know what trouble you may see tomorrow or what trouble somebody else may be in right now. So you don't know the things. You're weak. It's an infirmity. But the Spirit knows. So there are times we need to pray out of ourselves when words won't work. Jesus did it with strong crying and tears. There are times when sobs say a lot more than words. Jesus taught us to pray with perseverance and importunity. And I think diversity also. I think all of those words are adjectives of effective prayer. He talked to us about the widow and the judge. He talked to us about the man needing bread at midnight. All of these were in the context of prayer. And the New Testament talks about Elijah, who was a man of like passions as we are, and he prayed. Let's, let's, let's stop on Elijah just a moment. He prayed. He did pray. He prayed for fire to come down out of heaven and consume that sacrifice and prove that he was God. And it seems such a simple prayer. Read it. How many words is it? 49? Something like that. Just a short prayer. Not long. And all of a sudden, wham, fire came out of heaven, consumed the sacrifice, burned up the rocks, licked up the water, just consumed everything. And uh, he said, boys, come with me. I got something for you. And he went down there, took care of all the prophets, and my, it was a glorious day. But all of a sudden, he finds himself out on the side of the mountain. Now it's time for rain to come again. He's going to pray for rain. And he prays and nothing. 
He sends a servant, says, look toward the sea. And the servant goes, looks toward the sea, and he comes back and he says, like an auditor, there is nothing. Put his face between his knees again, he prayed. Raised up, now go look toward the sea. The man went and looked toward the sea. Came back and said, nothing. Why was this so much harder? What, what was, what's the deal? Why, why must I continue this? The third time, go look. The fourth time, go look. The fifth time, go look. The sixth time, that guy came back. There is nothing. Understand? Nothing. <laughs> but the Bible says he went again the seventh time. There are times when just one simple prayer, bang, there it is. And then there are other times when it doesn't come that way. It doesn't come that easily. There's going to take... It's going to take some sacrifice on your part. It's going to take some dying on your part. It's going to take some agony on your part. And not necessarily twisting God's arm to get him to do something, but getting yourself into the place where you can receive it in the right attitude and know what to do with it when it does come and be able to handle it when it does come. So he prayed, the Bible said, the seventh time. And the servant came back and he said, well, there's a rising out of the sea, a little cloud, like a man's hand. And his faith took hold of that. He put his hand in the hand of that cloud and said, hey, you and I are going to agree. It's going to rain. You're not heading for Mesopotamia. You're coming this way. It's going to rain. In fact, I hear the sound by faith of abundance of rain. He said, you tell Ahab to eat his lunch and get to town because if he doesn't, he's not going to be able to roll the chariot wheels because it's fixing to rain. It's going to get muddy around here. His faith was speaking. He had, he had felt in his spirit that God had answered. It's going to rain. And so oh, Ahab ate his lunch, told his driver to whip the horses. We're going into town. Here he's riding into town. Just a pumping and a going. Thunder and lightning. He's heading to town. All of a sudden, out of the corner of his eye. It's a man. Running. He's overtaking us. It's Elijah. He's got his garment wrapped around him like this. <laughs> Some men trust in chariots. And some in horses. <laughs> but I will trust in the name of the Lord. Running in the rain. Running in the spirit. Doing more than he could do because the Bible said the hand of the Lord was upon Elijah. He had been to the mountain to pray. He knew what was going to happen. And he knew what he ought to do. And he put it in overdrive. Passed him up. Put on his right blinker. <laughs> headed into town. And beat him in town. The Bible said he beat him in town. Got that before he did. You can do more than you can do if the hand of the Lord is upon you, you see. If you learn the secrets of prayer. And they're not real secrets. Anybody can know them. They're not mysterious. Anybody can know them. They're not commonly known, but anybody can know them. And you can know them too. Now this doesn't mean that God is our gopher. Standing by to provide our every whim. There are some things we shouldn't have. And that's where real trust in God comes into play. We trust him to know what we really do need. Oh, I, I learned a hard lesson. I've learned a lot of hard. It seemed like every lesson I ever learned was hard. <laughs> I remember uh, 
I've told some of you this before. When I was in Greensboro, I wanted a tent revival so badly. God, if I can just have a tent, I believe this place is, would just, I could really get the job done here. We're down here one day a week at this community center, and if I just had a tent, we could advertise and really get on with the program and get the job done. And I thought a tent was, oh, was what the ultimate. And I found a fellow had a tent. He said, you can use it free of charge, no problem. I said, boy, that's it. That's, see, things just working out. Uh, that's it. I want a tent. I got a tent. I want a place to put it. And so no doubt the Lord's going to provide it. And I just knocked on every possible door to get a tent up in that town. Every place where there was a vacant lot. Every place where I could possibly think of to put it. And every time I'd get a place, there would be some problem with it that it wouldn't work out. One place I got, oh, it was a perfect place. It was just right. And he said, uh, uh, no, he said that. Uh, the, the city said that we can't let you put the tent there because that's inside the city limits. And uh, my tent that I was going to get wasn't flame-proofed. I was going to have to soak it in salt water or something, you know, to flame-proof it. I said, okay, I'll get outside the city limits. So I went a mile outside the city limits, found a place right on the superhighway, all cleaned off, had a power pole there, everything just right. I said, yeah, use it, no problem. You can just dig a ditch around and whatever you want to do. And uh, it'll be fine. Just get right on there. But the city said, well, now, as the crow flies through the woods, it's less than a mile to the city limits. And so our building code extends to that plot of ground, and you can't put your tent up there. And I'll tell you what. As a young man, I was just, I wanted to croak. I was just beating my head against the wall, you know. Well, God, where are you anyhow? To let a little old thing like this stand in the way of what I want to do. I'm trying, I'm here, God, trying to do your work. I'm here. Can't you think of a lot of things to tell God sometimes, you know? Don't you know me, God? Don't you know who I am? Hey, it's me. You know, I'm here trying to do your work. I'm trying to get the job done. What's the matter? Where are you anyhow? You ever prayed like that or thought like that, rather? Yeah, he's hiding his face. Oh, I said, God. Okay, I've done everything I can do. So I took off going to a fellowship meeting on the way out of town. Instead of taking a super highway, I went to Old Road. I don't know why. Just went by, and, and about two miles out of town, I saw a place on the side of the road. It was vacant. I said, look at there, honey. So when I get back to town, I'm going to go see if that guy let us put a tent right there. So I came back Monday, went to talk to the man little village out there called Richardson Village. I talked to Mr. Richardson. I said, there's a vacant lot right down there. I said, I've been looking for a place to put a tent. I said, how about letting me put a tent down there for a revival? And I said, nah. I said, yeah, I figured that. <laughs> he said, they had a tent there one time. said, it didn't amount to much. Said, uh, said, why don't you use a church? I said, what church? He said, well, one right across the road there. And it was a church across the road, Baptist church. Had a, bab- had a sign hanging out. I said, well, that's a Baptist church. And he said, they hadn't had service there for over a month. He said, I own everything out here. He said, I own that church. He said, you, you want to use it? And I said, well, I sure do. And he let us use it. Standing there before the conversation was ended, he had agreed to let us use it a year rent free. So while I was pressing for this tent revival, God had a little white church out there. <laughs> just free of charge, waiting on me. We know not for what to pray as we ought. Sometimes you think you know what's good for you. You don't always know what's good for you. And you keep pressing and pressing and pressing and pressing. Uh, uh, and, and, and thinking you got it and, and you wanna, you're going to get it and it, it's what you need. It may not be what you need. Back off a little bit. We looked for one solid year for property for this college. Brother Prince and I went to, made how many trips to Dallas? How many trips to Northwest County? How many trips out there? Uh, days and days and weeks of, well, for one year. And it looks like nowhere. Nowhere we can afford to buy. Nowhere it's, it's reasonable. Nowhere it's, it's it, 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 sewer. Nowhere. So I backed off. I said, okay. I told Brother Prince one day in the office. I said, Brother Prince, now we've done everything we can do. We've knocked on every door, every possible opportunity. We've run down every lead. We've chased down everything. Now, there's nothing else I know of that we can do. And we're just going to have to let God work this out. Ask him if I didn't tell him that. 
within a week and a half, Brother Orlin Ray Foss said, hey, I want to show you some property. We went and looked at some other property. He said, well, I said, is there any, any place else? Sounded like asking for that prophet Micaiah. Did. I said, is there, any, is there any other place that you know of? He said, well, there is another place. It's on the other side of the highway over there. It's on the other side of I-45. It's on Goslin Road. Said, I Well, I want to see it. I felt like Jehoshaphat. I said, well, I want to see it. So he said, okay. So he took me out there to see it. It clicked. It was it. A week and a half after I totally backed off, I said, okay, God, we've done everything we can do. Now, it's, you know, if you want us to have it, provide it. Sometimes you get to that point. Sometimes you have to come to that place. But God's not going to do all that. You don't do that at the first. You don't say, all right, now, Lord, now, you did that for him and them and whatever. Now, I want you to do that for me right here at the first. Save me a year knocking on doors. Now, he's probably not going to do it because that year may, may be the time that you needed to spend doing that. Or There's other situations that you don't even know about in the background that God may know about. Timing in this is everything. So you do your best at all times. To do the will of God and when you do he'll he'll back you up he'll come to your rescue he knows right where you are he knows your name he knows your address I like what one sister said I even know his telephone number she said it's Jeremiah 33 and 3 she said call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not of praise God let me say this you can't force God to do things by believing. It's easy to think this, and I think maybe all of us have dabbled in it at one time or another, that if you can believe strongly enough, you can make God do things. Don't drift into that philosophy. Let me tell you, God is a sovereign God. He can take any course of action he chooses without remorse of conscience. That's what sovereign means. He's a boss. He runs everything. And uh, you can't force him to do something by conjuring up what we call faith and straining yourself and beating your head against the wall trying to believe God. I believe the Lord wants us to walk with him in faith daily. You can have faith walking down the sidewalk. You don't have to be all bowed up in a knot to have faith. Ooh, you know, you see people trying to conjure up faith, trying to believe God. You know what I'm talking about? If I can just believe if I could just cast this doubt out, then, then God will do it. Well, Jesus didn't say have faith in faith. He said have faith in God. Have faith in God. Believe that he is with you. Believe that he is interested in you. Have faith means that you trust him at all times. You trust his wisdom. You trust his knowledge. You trust his grace. You trust his power. In other words, he's not just with you when you conjure up faith. He's there when you're driving down the highway, when you're walking on the side, when you're doing your homework, when you're when you're playing ping pong. Do you know that? He said, I'm with you always. 
The man that walks in faith and confidence in God is not the man who just, uh, you know, periodically goes through all of these contortions and beats himself against the wall, you know, just trying to have faith in God. But the man that really has true faith in God is the man that walks in confidence in God. He's confident today. He'll be confident next week, next month, next year. And he knows that God is there whether or not he's into this contortion. I believe the Lord wants us to trust his power and his wisdom and his grace. Faith is not a force that is directed at God. Faith is to be placed in God. Faith is not something which forces God to do for us what we have believed he will do. When Jesus said on several occasions, he said, your faith has saved you. He didn't mean that, that some magic power triggered by believing uh, brought that about, but that faith opened the door for Jesus to do the work that he really wanted to do. If a person merely uh, was healed simply because he believed he was going to be healed, then the power is in the mind and not in God. If things happen simply because you believe they're going to, I see people trying to exemplify this attitude. You see their eyes trying to do certain things, of, of manifesting a certain kind of faith, a certain kind of believing. You know, uh, but hey, that's, that's, meant, that's mind science. The power is in God, a sovereign God, and not in you, and not in your mind. God is beyond the mind. His power is beyond the mind. His power is beyond the mind. We even conceive, as the song said. If the power was just in the mind, then God would just be a, what we call a placebo to activate your belief. You know what a placebo is? I used to have a, a pharmacist in the church, and he said, Brother Enzi says, it's real funny about folks. He said, they... Uh, uh, most sicknesses are psychosomatic. And he said, you can give them these little pills. They're what you call placebos. It's nothing but a sugar pill or something, you know. And you give them that. And uh, he said, I, he said, we got green, yellow, red, you know, different color capsules in it. And he says, doctors prescribe these. You can't read the prescription, but a lot of times a doctor will prescribe. And the, and the, and the pharmacist knows it's a placebo uh, to and he said, I've had people say, boy, those red ones uh, don't do anything for me, but those green ones, are re they really get the job done, you know, <laughs> when it's nothing but a placebo. And some people are actually bettered by them, helped by them, not really by the placebo, but by the fact they figured they were going to be. They figured this was medicine and it was going to help me. And I, hey, I feel better. That medicine really did me a lot of good. It's placebo. I believe we ought to trust in God, trust in his wisdom, trust in his power, trust in his knowledge of us and of our needs. He knows what we need before we even come to him. I believe that's what trusting in the wisdom of God really means. That's why, so trusting, we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Faith is purest when its object is simply Jesus. Simply Jesus. Let me close with this. I believe the Lord is standing ready to hear us pray. I believe he's standing ready to hear all men pray. God is not going to hear the prayer of those who will not open their lives up to him. God does not hear the sinner's prayer. When sinners pray to heap something up on their own lust, I don't believe God hears them. I believe a man that he, even though he is a sinner can pray and God can hear him if he is opening up his life to the leadership of God. 
to do that which will lead him to repentance. But the Bible says the prayer of the unrighteous is an abomination in the nostrils of God. But Bonda prayed. He was just a native in a mud hut in Africa. His wife was sick with a dread disease. And so this disease had, had taken her body and, and made her virtually a dish rag. And she was dying, losing weight. He had to carry her everywhere she went. He went out on the hillside one night. This is in South Africa. He went out on the hillside one night and he said, he looked up into the sky and he said, uh, the white men tell us of a God out there. He said, I'm sorry. I don't even know your name. But he said, if, if, if you are God, this is my prayer. Help me with my wife. He went back and laid down. He said, shortly, there stood by me, he said, a man clothed in light. And this man said, go to East Ruston, and there you will find help for your wife. The next morning, he got his wife up. He put her in that little carrying sack that he carried her in on his back, and he took her to East Ruston. He walked around that city all day. He wondered why. He was looking for witch doctors. He thought, surely this would be the what? The voice was talking about there would be some witch doctor there. He said, everybody said, all the witch doctors are over on the other side of town. But he knew the voice said East Ruston. So all the hot day he walked and looked and wondered, but nothing. Late in the evening, he came by a street. He looked down the street. He saw a tent under which were chairs. He wanted to sit down. He went and sat down. It just so happened it was a tent stretched by brother and sister Freeman preaching a revival there at the close of the service he sat through the service at the close of the service sister freeman said those that need something from god who want to help from the lord come come up here and he brought his wife up there and he says i need help with my wife sister freeman brother freeman laid hands on his wife god healed that woman right there she's still living today Bonda and his wife both repented, were baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. He is pastoring one of our churches today in South Africa. But he began it all with a prayer out on the side of a hill, saying to God, I'm sorry, I don't even know your name. I'm telling you, God's ready to hear folks pray. God's ready to hear folks pray that are sincere and opening their lives up to God, even though you've received the Holy Ghost when you pray. Be sincere and open your life up to God and submit yourself to the will of the Lord, and he'll never turn you away. Let's stand together. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands to the Lord. Let's ask him to teach us to pray. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Teach us how to exercise faith in God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Please like, comment, and subscribe.